today's podcast, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Sue Varma. She is a board-certified psychiatrist, and we're going to talk all about her new book, Practical Optimism. We're going to discuss how you can take very practical steps to improving your outlook on life so that you can live a longer, healthier, and happier life. But before we do that, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Suzanne123. Suzanne123 left a nice review of this podcast on iTunes stating, with plastic surgery becoming so widespread, it is great to listen to a qualified and informed voice on the subject. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne123, for leaving this review on iTunes. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, if you can leave a rating or review on iTunes uh, or on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, it definitely helps me spread the word. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Dr. Sue Varma. Dr. Sue Varma is a distinguished psychiatrist and cognitive behavioral therapist based in New York City. With over two decades of private practice experience, Dr. Varma has made significant contributions to the field of mental health. Notably, she served as a pioneering medical director and psychiatrist for the esteemed 9-11 Mental Health Program at NYU. Alongside her clinical work, Dr. Varma holds the position of a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at New York University Langone Health. Her accomplishments have been recognized by the American Psychiatric Association, where she was honored as a distinguished fellow, the highest honor bestowed upon its members. Throughout her career, Dr. Varma has received numerous pre prestigious awards for her groundbreaking work in mental health education and advocacy, two Share Care Emmy Awards, the Ivan Goldberg Award for Outstanding Service, and a Mayoral Proclamation. So I'm really excited to bring Dr. Sue Varma to the podcast. Let's get started. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. I love everything you do. So I'm so excited oh, to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start by talking a bit about your background. So you are a psychiatrist yes. and you had a very interesting um, experience because you were in New York City at the time of 9-11. Can you tell me really how what, what stage of your training you were in at that time or your practice and then where that went to from there? Yes. So I was in clinical rotations um, in New York City. So I was in medical school and, you know, I, I was on the path to becoming a psychiatrist, but, you know, I had never had experience with this level of trauma. And, and I don't think any of us really did. Um, mm -hmm. But those moments really shaped me in a lot of ways. Like I decided that I wanted to pursue training in trauma psychiatry. And so I continued medical school, went to residency. And as I was egg, like, you know, in my senior year and thinking about what work to do now, fast forward, you know, almost three or four years later, um, there was a new program that um, was at NYU Medical Center and it was called the World Trade Center Environmental Healthcare Center. And part of it mm -hmm. was psychiatry, mental health. And this was really kind of a novel program. And I was like, yes, I'm very interested. And there were, you know, rigorous process of selection. But there was definitely like an imposter syndrome of like, wait a minute, you really want me? I, I love this. I love this opportunity. And it really touched us all. I think 9-11 affected you no matter where in the country you were living at the time or no matter what you were doing. But what was so unique, Anthony, um, is that this program had mental health in the fold of all the medical care. So you would come in to get tested from head to toe, sinus, allergies, GI, cancer, all of the things that we saw people who were either living down there or involved in the rescue, recovery, cleanup, were having medical problems. But then they would get screened for anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress. And it was so interesting to me, number one, to see finally this is like mental health getting the attention that it deserves but then also what was it about some people that made them sort of quote more resilient and never needed the help of the mental health team so they would get screened but they would test negative so then mm -hmm. that became sort of the focus of what is resilience about and what i found was that optimism was a key component of that so you were seeing people who i mean really first responders it was my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, there were either people who responded, they were there, and they didn't survive, or because I had a friend of mine who was an anesthesiologist, and he was in residency at that time, and he said, you know, we we're all waiting, and we we're waiting yes. for everybody to come in, yes. and we we're ready, and nobody came and in. Nobody came because nobody survived. Yes. Uh, and so I feel like, you know, the the people that you were seeing, I'm assuming there was a lot of trauma, yes. but how much of them had actually experienced and been down there versus the trauma of just waiting and you know, 
finding that you can't do anything as much as you wanted to. Yeah, so, you know, it's such a good point because a lot of the patients that I saw were physically there. Like, so they were either in mm. the building that day, they were working, um, that they lost their colleagues, people that they had worked with 20, 30 years and had established bonds mm. with, or there were people who were just coming out of the subway and saw the towers get hit. So there were people who were living there that day. So really everything. And then those who were involved in the rescue and recovery. So they were like in, engineers or first responders, um, you know, including police, firefighters. Yeah. They were therapists. I mean, everything that you can imagine. And, you know, what was interesting is a lot of these folks involved in the rescue and recovery had prior history of trauma. So if you're a first responder, you know, you've seen it all. Or the rescue and recovery part was a lot of folks from South America who had escaped as political refugees, who were maybe victims of domestic violence. So there's layer upon layer. And I kind of think of it as like the second shoe dropping for a lot of people, people mm -hmm. who had just barely maintained it and then everything fell. And then to your point, mm -hmm. vicarious trauma as a healthcare provider, or just as, as, as someone living in New York City at the time. So it, it's a lot on a lot of layers. Yeah. yeah. So you ended up uh, treating a lot of them. I know um, you were, um, let me just see here. You, you are, the work that you're doing with them, what was the name of it again? So it was the World Trade Center Mental Health Program. And, oh, that's right. and that was yeah, that's part right. of a bigger, you know, program that, and, and it's still, you know, in, in still there. And it follows people for years um, and, and sort of looks at outcomes. So, you know, it, to me, the fact that you could go down the hall and talk to the allergy doc, you could talk to the GI doc, like that level of sort of coordination of care and being able to get like different specialties weigh in is very interesting because a lot of patients are more comfortable talking about their physical health than they are about their mental health. So they may say like, no, I'm totally fine, no anxiety, no depression. And then meanwhile, the doctor, the you know internist is like, no, this patient is not sleeping. They have pain from head to toe. So it's very interesting because now I'm in private practice and I work with patients in cognitive behavioral therapy, I might reach out to their um, physician, let's say in the beginning to get collateral, but you're never getting real time down the hall input from four or five different people. And then this program also offered art, art therapy services, yoga therapy, meditation, cognitive behavioral therapy on a group level. And then within our mental health team, we had psychologists, social work, dance therapy, creative arts. So it was really a very robust, I mean, very rich and robust experience for someone early in their career to be like, this is what kind of like an ideal program looks like. Yeah. I mean, no, there's no ideal anything, but just the fact that you can work with colleagues from different disciplines. And, you know, a lot of us, we had peer reviewed sort of like, like journal club, we brought in trauma experts. We consulted with people who worked with like the VA, for example, or who had a variety of experiences maybe that we didn't. So it was very much like a learning and a growth process as, as well as treating patients. That's actually, I find that refreshing. You know, when I, I did psychiatry rotations when I was in medical school and my rotation was at the local maximum security prison. And uh, it was very interesting, um, but really what did we do with the psychiatrist? It was basically just giving meds. Yes. And they would talk to them, how'd you do this week? Oh, I did this or that. And like, okay, here's your medication. And then they would write the script, you know, send it to the, um, the pharmacy there in the prison and then bring the next patient in. And there was no real idea of this type of a holistic kind of whole body approach that you're talking about. And I'm so glad that, that you're doing that because I feel like so much of psychiatry has been given a bad rap as essentially just pill pushers. Yes. Uh, and the fact that you're in a group that is doing so much more, I think is so important. So you've really focused your career now um, on this idea of practical optimism. And that's the title of your new book, your new best-selling book, Practical Optimism. So let's talk a little bit about that. Before we do, though, I'd like to give just a couple of really sobering statistics that I took from your book. Um, there was a Gallup poll in 2019 that surveyed 150,000 people from 140 countries, and 55% of Americans experience stress, quote, a lot of the day, unquote, compared to 35% globally. Six, there is a 65% increase in antidepressant use from 1999 to 2014. One in eight Americans over the age of 12 has taken an antidepressant in the last month. One in eight. I mean, this is, like I said, these are sobering statistics. And these were taken before COVID and everything has happened since then. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And, you know, you've been in practice for a while now. How has 
things changed over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. Yes. So, you know, on one hand, I want to say that people, there is more awareness and that mm -hmm. some, some of what we might be seeing this uptick in treatment is people doing the right thing by themselves is seeking care, right? So could it be that we simply are having diagnostic measures in place, for example, primary care doctors, including mental health screenings as part of the fold, making prenatal visits, anxiety and depression screenings, part of the fold, pediatric visits. So I think part of it is simply that we have the awareness and we have the diagnostic tools that we're implementing. And at the same time, it also speaks to me about the fact that there's a real need, right? So I'm not saying that things are better, but they could be worse. But mm -hmm. the, what we're seeing is that for me, if you asked me what's happening, if you look at these crisis, opioid crisis, fentanyl, you know, substance abuse, general umbrella, mm -hmm. cyber bullying, um, bullying, social media and digital use in young people, loneliness crisis, feeling alienated and disconnected from the people around you, you know, it's no surprise that as these three crises, you know, are, are increasing, so are the rates of anxiety and depression. And what we're seeing, like the CDC talked about the suicide rate increasing by 30% in 30 years, looking from the 1990s to present day. And one of the key things that they pulled out is this idea of self-reliance and almost like hyper self-reliance. I can do it. And it mm -hmm. very much is sort of like what our the United States is built on is this idea yeah. of I can do. And I love that. And we see this like push in entrepreneurship and like, you know, this feeling of self-efficacy. What people forget is that we are social creatures in our survival, whether in years past our physical survival depended on the tribe, so to speak, and now our emotional and social and psychological survival still depends on a community. And yet we are losing the very fabric of our society, which is other people. So mm -hmm. if you asked me, and it sounds so like touchy-feely and woo-woo, but I see this every single day that people are extremely, extremely lonely. Um, and, you know, Anthony, I happen to be, you know, recording to you from a green room at NBC. And what I'm talking about today is a very interesting phenomena about loneliness. Elmo, the Sesame Street character, asked people online, how are you doing? And they were flooded with responses of not well, I'm lonely, mm -hmm. I'm anxious, I'm depressed. So then the question is, oh my God, why is everyone talking to Elmo? Well, we feel comfortable, but we're also in crisis. So to me, like all of these things speak to the fact that we need each other. And that's why for me, one of the eight pillars, I talk about eight pillars of practical optimism, people is a big one. And this was my favorite chapter to write. There's so much research on the loneliness epidemic and, um, and how it's connected to mental health rates escalating. Well, let's get into some practical options to improve it. Yeah. And let's start by talking about the term practical optimist. And once again, this is the title of your new book, Practical Optimism, The Art, Science and Practice of Exceptional Well-Being. So we've got issues in our society. As you said, people are lonely. We've had obviously our own kind of crises. We've gone from kind of one to another and now we're dealing with wars. We just got through a global pandemic. Um, and you've got some solutions for how people can improve their lives and kind of deal with these types of things. And, and the book is fantastic. I want to let you know I did go through it over the last several days. Thank you so much. Um, but let's start by talking about what specifically is a practical optimist. Yes. So optimism is about our ability to look at any situation in life and sort of imagine um, a favorable outcome. So it's hoping, it's wanting, it's wishing, it's imagining a favorable outcome. And I'm saying absolutely, wish, want, hope, right? But hope is a noun and it's a verb, right? So practical optimism is how we convert fantasy, dreams, and ideas into realistic outcomes. It's taking favorable outlooks and turning them into favorable outcomes by being very proactive, by being actionable, by saying, how do I get from point A to point B? What are the steps that I need to take? Who do I need to call upon to in, involve in my tribe of mentors in my support system? What are the obstacles that are gonna come along the way? How do I anticipate them? How do I solve for them in advance? Inevitably, obstacles will be there. Then what do I do? How do I persevere? So it really says that if you wanna achieve something, it's great to quote manifest, which is like the word of the decade, I would yeah. say. 
but it's also teaching you that life is going to be full of disappointment and grief and how can you manage your emotions so that you can accomplish what you want. So what is the difference then between, let's say, being a practical optimist or just being a happy person or some people call it toxic positivity? Like, how is being a practical optimist different than just saying, hey, I'm always happy, I'm always happy. Um, is there a difference there? Yes. So look, you know, God bless those people who wake up every morning with excitement and enthusiasm. I don't know, Anthony, are you one of them? Do you wake up every morning? No, <laughs> <laughs> especially when, especially if it's 530 in the morning, I'm getting ready for surgery. No. Yeah. So then practical <sighs> optimism is going to be the default because you obviously, you know, are super successful and um, productive, right? So then, you know, for me, even every morning, I'm not waking up, jumping out of bed, being like, rah, rah, like, you know, the day is all mine. And that's where practical mm -hmm. optimism comes in because the reality is, that pessimists, believe it or not, are actually more realistic. They're more accurate in their assessment of things. And so pessimism, even though you didn't specifically ask me about it, is an important part of this whole discussion because on one hand, we have unrealistic optimism, which is everything is gonna f work out. It's like the patient coming to yeah. the doctor and the doctor's like, but you have cancer, but you have elevated cholesterol and all these medical problems. And the person, it comes in in one ear and goes out the other. And what we call the ostrich effect is where they're burying their head in the sand and they're like, it's all good. It'll work itself out. What are you going to do about it? You ask the patient. No, no, no. It'll work itself out. That's, that's toxic positivity. Figure, you know, everything will work out and, and just look on the bright side. It's dismissive. It doesn't understand the gravity of the situation. So that's toxic positivity or unrealistic. On the other hand, you have the pessimist who's probably can, can assess the situation very clearly. Oh no, oh shoot, I'm gonna, something bad's gonna happen. But then they get mired in negativity and they go down a downward spiral by envisioning the worst case scenario. The practical optimist is right in between and they're like, all right, I hear what you're saying, something bad is going on in my body, for example, if they just got a diagnosis of an illness and they validate their feelings they feel the grief because we're not saying just get over it and move on, right? Take your time. And when they're ready, they then say, what do I need to do? In a very sort of calm, cool, and collected manner. So how much of this are you born with and how much of this can, do you need to basically develop yourself? I mean, this sounds like you're giving work to people yes. in that you're saying, hey, this happens and you must act. Yes, yes. Is there any way that this is something that just comes naturally to people or is this truly like a muscle that you have to work? You have to make a, a definitive decision that I'm going to act in this way. Yes. Great question, because, you know, we all have those friends who like naturally have a higher metabolism or whatever, you know, like higher muscle mass, like don't have to work out. I just had had dinner with the, with a friend and I was like, what do you do to stay in shape? She's like, you don't want to know. I work out only one time a week. And I was like. I couldn't, if I did that, I would not, you know, be able to achieve. Like, so some of us are naturally born with any number of things. So absolutely, there is a component of optimism that is genetic. And in fact, um, researchers from UCLA in around 2011 discovered that there possibly is a genetic component to optimism. And it's through the oxytocin receptor gene. It says that this gene, depending on the variant, could be coding for oxytocin receptor gene, which is associated with social and emotional bonding um, and psychological resources and coping mechanisms. And what I found so fascinating is a couple of things. One is only 25% of optimism is genetic. The rest is learned. So if you are one of those naturally glass half full people, great. You may not have to work on, on your optimism. However, I would still invite you to do so because all of us have blind spots. There are plenty of people who are optimistic in work, but not in relationships, in relationships, but not in their personal life. I, I give people an, ass an assessment in the beginning and I ask them for each of the eight pillars, five questions to kind of get a sense of, they're very broad strokes, very big picture thinking and say, you know, these are the eight pillars and where do you feel like you need more help? So absolutely, you were right that it is a muscle and that it is a practice and it is something that you have to work on. But the most fascinating part of all of this discovery that the scientists uncovered is that optimism is something that can be learned and trained. Because I realized I'm already doing this in my practice. I'm already helping people develop cognitive flexibility, develop coping mechanisms, 
and the fact that there are certain ways that if you put this all together, this is the full package. This is, if you do all of this, I'm not saying it's going to cure you of depression and anxiety because you still need to be in therapy. Nothing can replace individualized one-on-one -on -one care. And at the mm -hmm. same time, how are you going to maintain your gains? A lot of times, let's say if people stop therapy or they stop medication, they kind of go back to their baseline. They may have a genetic predisposition to pessimism, to depression. So this is for you, for anybody, no matter where they're at. If you're in treatment, don't stop, use it. And then if you want to maintain, this is a great tool to use as well. So let's go over the eight pillars of practical optimism, because I think this gives people a idea, kind of a framework of what your book is about and maybe some of the directions that they can go from it. So can you go over these eight pillars for me? Sure. So, you know, there's no particular order, but I, I like it in this order in that practical optimism can be used in itself as a practice and a habit, but it's a habit that begets all other habits. And I happen to put it in this um, arc, if you will, and in this order for a reason. So it starts mm -hmm. out by having purpose. Purpose can be capital P, purpose in life, what do you want to achieve? Or it can be small p, what is my intention in this specific relationship, in this specific action, in this job? And I always say about purpose is if you can't find it, it's your job to create it. A lot of times people are waiting for motivation to strike them. I say no. A big part of what we learned in training in behavioral therapy is put the cart before the horse. And if you populate your calendar with challenges of choice, meaningful activities, things that are pleasurable, but A, help you connect to other people and give back, because there's so much study about the benefits of volunteering. And there was even a study, which I love, that showed that adolescents that volunteered had less inflammation and cardiac disease like later on in life. And I was like, oh my God, hmm. helping someone do their homework on a regular basis as a teenager can be really helpful. So purpose is about connecting to your own unique habits and talents. It has nothing to do with what, what world wants from you. Your purpose yesterday may not be your purpose today, may not be your purpose tomorrow. So I give you people a bunch of different steps of tangible, actionable items. Listening to your podcast, for example, can invigorate somebody's sense of purpose to be like, oh my God, I learned something really new and valuable. I'm going to do it. And the best tip that I learned from all of this is if you are just lost in your finding your purpose, exercise. Exercise creates a sense of purpose by boosting your mood, giving you a feeling of agency and the sort of positive can-do attitude. So exercise is a great way to, to boost your sense of purpose. Okay, before we go to number two, then what is your sense of purpose, Dr. Sue Varma? Oh my God, I'm living it right now. Me talking to you as cheesy as that may sound. <laughs> I hope that's not the purpose. <laughs> but it's little p, right? My purpose today is to help inform, educate, inspire, and motivate. And I would say that's my purpose today and every day. Yeah. I feel so yeah. blessed and so moved. And you know, when I say I don't wake up every single day, like you rah, 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 in the sense that yeah. like, there's life. I have kids. I'm a mom. Like I'm, I'm a physician. I see patients. I, my heart and my soul and my mind is divided in a hundred different places every day because I'm so driven by purpose. But the reality is it can be exhausting as well. So I don't want anyone to think yeah. that like, and, and it took me time, right, to create this life, to be able to have a creative outlet, to be able to speak to you, to be able to speak to the media. I, I'm on faculty at NYU, so I get to teach residents and trainees um, as a parent, as a friend, as a daughter. So I feel like I'm, I, have, I play a lot of roles, and whatever I do, I want to give 100%. But I feel inspired by learning, and I feel like when I learn something, I'm so excited to be like, oh, my God, I want to share it. Like, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd at heart. I mean, you must be, too. I, I've watched your videos. Hey, don't call me a nerd. <laughs> yes, but yeah. you're a cool nerd. <laughs> I th yeah, I think, you know, I was reading your book and I thought, you know, what, what's my purpose? I think on a, in a general sense, I feel like my purpose is try to leave the world better than I came in to, to make some type of a difference so that maybe the world is a little, just a little bit better because of me. I think that, you know, other than that, I mean, you know, people have purpose of, oh, you know, I want to raise my kids well. I want to be a good mom or a good dad or, you know, a good doctor. But I think in the end, I think looking at it from a, you know, kind of a big, big picture perspective is, is hopefully the world will be just a tiny bit better because I was in it versus the hundred percent, hundred percent. And you're giving and, and congratulations to you on your book because you're giving people oh, like really you. actionable tools to feel because that's what this is about. What you're doing is like and I and I feel similarly is like you're informing, you're educating, you're inspiring, you're motivating. And the way you do it is by giving people 
information so that they can use it to be the best versions of themselves. So like, to me, exactly. that's sort of a common denominator, I feel like between what both of us are doing. Well, let's go to pillar number two, and we're going to move through some of these, but I do want to spend a little more time on pillar eight, okay. because I think that's um, very practical. But let's talk about uh, the other pillars yes. here, kind of going through them fairly quickly. Yeah, sure. So processing is about um, being aware of your emotions and not letting them take control over you, but rather you managing them. And there's an, a, a, a quick exercise I tell people, name it, claim it, tame it, and reframe it. So name your emotion, name the trigger, claim it, where in the body is it causing destruction and havoc? It could be in the form of headaches and anxiety and insomnia and bowel symptoms. And then tame it by doing any number of exercises, deep breathing, muscle relaxation, journaling, which is huge because it actually costs more emotional energy to suppress emotions than it does to mm -hmm. express them. And so expression can be in the form of venting. It could be talking to a therapist. It could be writing a letter to someone that you never send. It could be journaling. Mm -hmm. And then reframing it, this is the the best form of, um, if, if you were talking about getting over trauma, big T, life-threatening things, small T, everyday hassles, being able to reframe a situation. This was a big part of the work that I did as a patient in my own therapy, because at some point I was like, I can't manage all the demands. Um, my mother was very sick. I was working 100 hours a week in the hospital as a resident, running around to five different hospitals on a daily basis. And I had to come to terms with the fact that like, my body is expressing what my mind cannot. And so I think it's really mm. important that people um, learn to process emotions effectively. And that is like the one minute version, but you know, I hope that people take the time to do it either through this book or, and or in therapy. So the next one is problem solving. And at any given point, we are contending with a battle on two fronts, out there in the real world, problems that need to be solved, actionable items, anticipating obstacles and then what's going on in our own mind. So we, that is where both the emotional regulation comes in. Now, the last P was about processing emotions. This is going one step further and it says, all right, what am I gonna do with these emotions and how am I not gonna let them interfere with the real life, real time plan that has to get executed? If I'm at home and I'm perseverating about God knows what, I will never even leave the house to be able to put my clothes on and set myself up to be able to respond, put out the fire, so to speak. So problem solving, I have like a 25 question list. Let's say you're stuck, you don't know what to do in life, you wanna change careers. Go through this, ask yourself, do a little writing exercise to give you clarity and then to give you action because that's what you need, both clarity and action and problem solving. The next one, pride, this pillar is about getting in touch with yourself in a way that is compassionate. And what I mean by that is self-esteem typically changes like like the, the weather. Um, and if something good happens, self-esteem, you know, woos. If something bad happens, if you lose, you know, a competition or you fail a test, your self-esteem plummets. So there can be such a wide range on a, on a daily basis. Um, let's say like living in the desert, it could be, you know, 35 degree at night and 75 degrees in the daytime. There's a huge fluctuation. Self-compassion, on the other hand, is gr grounded, intrinsic sense of self-worth that you deserve simply because you're human. That's it, it exists, your self-worth exists simply because you do. I'm sorry, how can somebody then avoid those ups and downs of beating themselves up when let's say they fail at something um, and then being on such a high when it, when it goes well? I mean, is, are there any practical things that they can do to try to reframe that? Yes, so look, I, I'm all for the highs when, you, when something works out. And really most people, what they need to do is manage the lows when they, when, they, yeah. when they fail. And a lot of it is driven by, unfortunately, society, which says that your self-worth is only as good as your last project. Your last project tanked and you're a failure. And then we, we buy into that, right? Or maybe yeah. that is what we project, even if the world isn't saying that to us. So one of the common things that I've learned from the research that I did, um, and uh, Kristen Neff was, is a big self-compassion researcher. I've learned so much from her work. And she talks about these three key things and they can be done in an exercise. So the next time you're beating yourself up, first mindful observation of what those thoughts are. I'm no good, I'm a loser, I'm a failure. Then acceptance of the reality of the situation. Now I happen to be a cognitive behavioral therapist. So if somebody is telling me I'm no good, I'm a failure, Part of my job is to help them figure out what are you doing right now and it's something called negative filtering where you think take one bad aspect of something and then you look you just 
look at the whole thing from that negative you, you, lens. You forget, it's called discounting the positives. Okay, yeah, you failed, but how many other things have you succeeded at? Let's, let's name them, let's list them. So certain exercises like, what would you tell a friend? How are you gonna feel about this five years from now? These are good ways. What's an alternative way of looking at it? What have I learned? So these are cognitive strategies that help you reframe. They help you figure out what the distortion is because inevitably when we're beating ourselves up, there's some cognitive distortion. Um, catastrophizing, jumping to conclusions, fortune telling. And then the last part of what she says, which I love, is this idea of common humanity, is I'm not alone. I'm not the first one to ever fail at something. Yes, this feels humiliating because maybe it's on a public level. Maybe everybody knows that I failed. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a position you didn't get, a promotion. And it takes time because if you're conditioned to tie your self-worth to your accomplishments, and I know so many people do, and in my practice, I'll see a lot of high-achieving people, including physicians. And I remember one patient that I was working with and she was she didn't get the, the she brilliant woman and had uh, attained a certain level of success, but then was stagnant in her career for some time and was really beating herself up and was like, other people have moved you know, beyond me. My marriage didn't fail. I feel like a loser. And I was like, let's list all the positives. And she had so much going for her. And one of them was having very loyal, close-knit friendships. And when I said that to mm -hmm. her, she like burst into laughter and she was like, are you kidding me? friendships, that's what you're going to put on my list of accomplishments. And I thought it was so interesting because I was like, yes, yeah. while there is no certificate that I can put on your wall because you have a million of them already, friendship certificate, do you know how special it is, unique it is, how rare it is? And then I would tell her, I'm like, do you know the science behind that? Like if you are for, for women and men, we know that like the Harvard studies that came out of this, the friendship studies that you can look at a person's friendships in their 40s and 50s and say that I can predict your health at 80 based on your social circle right now. So I was like, yeah, you're winning wow. at life. You're winning at life. So we discount so many things that we're naturally good at. We take them for granted. Do you think that there are some people who just go through life and, you know, the things that we're talking about are very introspective. Like, you know, you really have to look at yourself um, objectively, like you step outside of yourself and say, hey, you know what? Look at the situation that you're in. Look at, you know, you're focusing on this one event that was disappointing in your life. And now you're coloring everything by that event. So why don't you step outside of yourself and look at the whole picture of your life and your relationships and how much they mean to you and what you've accomplished. But do you think there are people who just can't do that, where they are unable to literally step out outside themselves? Because it's almost kind of like the whole idea of empathy. Like, you know, I feel that there are people in my life that do not understand empathy. Like they maybe will give you a dictionary definition yes. of it, but could they actually step outside of their own opinions and try to step into the shoes of somebody else or at the same time, step outside and look at themselves objectively, but not from their own very colored lens. Yes. You know, that's so beautiful that you mentioned that because you're a hundred percent right. There are some people who are going to go through life who really do lack self-awareness and it is, mm -hmm. it's going to take something really jarring to make them be interested in even questioning their perception of reality if it's not been helpful to them. And I'll often see people who come to see me whose life was working out perfectly. And so they were like, why do I need to be introspective? I'm awesome. Until their partner left them, until they got fired. Yeah. And people were like, you're not a team player. You're arrogant. You think you know everything. So something, they had to eat humble pie, so to speak. Something yeah. knocked them off this upward trajectory that they were on and became very complacent and were maybe always arrogant. And then they were like, oh my God, I don't have all the answers. And they very, maybe reluctantly come to get help. And it's so hard. And, you know, in an extreme situation, people might have you know, what we call personality disorders, and they lack the ability to sort of have the self-awareness or, yeah. you know, there's an extreme, yes, there's, they might be self-loathing, but they come across as, you know, what we are now calling narcissism and, you know, on that spectrum. But 100% they're people who lack the self-awareness and also, and also people who, who genuinely lack empathy, you know, and that's really sad and, and unfortunate. And there's all degrees of that. And one way as a parent, that if you want to make sure your kids have empathy because that should be a skill or a trait that one should beef up in their child because it will serve them in life yeah reading literature um fiction particularly literary fiction is very helpful because there's something called a theory of the mind 
where when you're reading these stories, it helps children develop perspective. Oh, that's so interesting. I wonder what the character is thinking. I wonder what they're feeling. I wonder what decision they're going to make next. Even as adults, reading has its benefits. So A, you have to have interest in developing empathy because otherwise you're if you don't have it, you may not know you don't have it, or you may yeah. think you have it. Yeah. So it's tricky, yeah. or it make t- it takes some a loved one to push you to be like, hey, you know. And that's where the couples therapy can also be helpful, where one partner brings another person in. But I think what you're hitting at is ultimately, there's got to be a seed of self awareness that can grow if it's watered properly. Um, so let's skip over a couple of these pillars because I know they can get them in your book. But I really want to focus before we finish. I know we have a limited amount of time <clears throat> time here on pillar eight, and that's practicing health habits, Um, using practical optimism and other science-based hacks to create and sustain new habits. One thing that I found that was really interesting in your book that I didn't realize, let me see if I can pull out the specific statistic, but um, it says, uh, okay, here we go. Optimists live longer, are healthier, recover from stress, injury, and illness faster, and they sleep longer and better. Uh, an article from September uh, 2019 of uh, JAMA Network Open, the researchers reported that not only is optimism associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular events, but it can also decrease death by all causes. So essentially, you're saying if you go through life as an optimist, if you try to look at some of the uh, better parts of life, not a glass is half empty type of a thing, you could live longer and healthier and happier lives afterwards. I can understand the happier life because you're not focused on the negatives. But how does being an optimist actually improve your health overall and even your health span, the amount of time that you live a healthy life? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, from dental health to mental health, optimists invest in their habits because they believe that their life is worth it. And you are more likely to pursue, let's say, your annual visit. You're more likely to get screenings. You're more likely to keep up with the recommended guidelines, whether it be from exercise to nutrition to medical visits. And then when you get a diagnosis, instead of burying your head in the sand, you're more likely to follow up with appropriate treatment. You're more likely to seek out, let's say, second opinions, to get consultations, all the things that we take for granted that a pessimist might not do. So it's an outlook, but that it's an outlook that leads to actionable change. Optimists are also more likely to be non-smokers. They're also more likely to mm-hmm. wear seatbelts. So certain safety precautions that we don't realize um, that are built in, it's, it's in the habits, but it's also in the mindset because the negative thinking and the ruminating increases cortisol, norepinephrine, and all of that puts us at risk for various, you know, sort of cardiovascular disease, we're less likely to exercise. Optimists are more likely to exercise. So all of these health habits cumulatively and seeking help, seeking support, maintaining relationships. We know that strong, healthy relationships are a huge antidote and buffer. In fact, we know that loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes per day. And loneliness oh is the, yes, it is like the worse than sedentary living in so many ways. So there's real science behind all of the actionable things that optimists do. Is it, I mean, can somebody who is kind of a natural pessimist, can they actually become a quote unquote natural practical optimist? Or is this something that they have to every day kind of struggle to, to, to make this decision that they're going to be an optimist? Because you know, I know there are some people that, that I know of who are just natural pessimists. Yeah. Is this something that's just going to be like a, a struggle for them the rest of their life? Or is there something that that they can do. You know, I know one of the big things you talk about in the book are, are habits and, and making, you know, being so important to just stick to these certain habits yes. because they're easy to stick with. I mean, is that the path? Yes. Uh, habits basically from going from a pessimist to an optimist without having to struggle with it every day yes. to make these conscious decisions? Yes. And, you know, Anthony, I can say this with confidence because I have worked with people in the darkest of times. I do this every single day with people, right? So somebody may be like, okay, well, you know, how can you tell me to just will my way into optimism. And I'm like, I do this, like the work, the practice of the work that I do with patients. Sometimes you are going to need to see a therapist. It's not going to come easy to you. But in the treatment of depression, for example, so like that's not just pessimism. I'm giving you an extreme form of pessimism is is major depression, for example. A person stops engaging in the things that they once used to enjoy. In fact, that's the hallmark of depression is anhedonia, lack of pleasure, lack of interest 
in the things you once used to enjoy, as well as a depressed mood. And the treatment for depression is putting the cart before the horse, what, what is known as behavioral activation. And one of the techniques that's used in cognitive behavioral therapy is populating your calendar the whole week with things that used to bring you joy. And if you were like, oh, I was invited to um, a, a small dinner party and um, I would have gone, but I don't know, I'm feeling depressed. I don't want to get out of my pajamas. I don't want to talk to people. That seems like so much effort. A lot of times people avoid social connection. And I'm like, nope, mm -hmm. if it's safe, let's say you're not worried about getting sick or anything and you're not sick yourself, you're not spreading germs and viruses, and we're just talking about a straight up dinner party, go. So seeing people in person, all the things that people do when they're feeling highly pessimistic, oh, why should I go to this networking event? You know, I don't look good and I don't sound good and no one's going to like me. Nope. If it's good for you and it can further your career, it can further, you're going to go. And I push my patients, even if they're not coming in. And I, you know, I get it. Like in the midst, in the depths of depression, somebody's like, freaking kidding me, lady, Dr. Sue, you, are you kidding me? I don't want to get out of bed. What are you talking about going on networking? Yeah. We start small. And then what I'll say is, okay, let's make a plan. Okay, let's say on a one to 10 level 10, this is so scary for you to speak at a conference. Don't speak at the conference, just show up. You don't want to go for five day conference, go for one day. You don't want to go in person, sign up online. So I don't take no, like if somebody is coming to me for treatment and I wanted to reach so many more people, which is why I wrote the book, because I can't possibly see everyone in the world, but I wanted to give a piece of sort of my heart, my wisdom, my learned experience, lived experience and science to say, take it small. If something is super scary, let's break it into bite-sized pieces. And I can guarantee you, mm -hmm. there are going to be some people who are going to be pessimistic. Nothing will ever serve them. That's because they don't want to. You have to be open. You have to be willing. And how does that relate to, there's a, um, a quote from your book, set low barriers for positive behaviors, high barriers for negative ones. Yeah. So make it easy, make it accessible. If you're like, you know what, I want to eat healthier. I buy myself sometimes chopped vegetables because I'm like, if I, when I get home at night and if they're not easily accessible, lower the entry barrier. So all these people were like, no, I'm going to cut the vegetables myself. And I'm like, well, if that's not happening, it's not happening. And, and so whatever the equivalent, just use that as a metaphor, right? Keeping the sneakers by the bedside, keeping the workout clothes the night before, making a plan, signing up for a class. If you know that you're less likely to no show because you've paid for it or making a plan with a friend to go to a workout class because you're less likely to cancel. So make, make ease, make good things accessible and available. And all that snacks that are like really bad, be, like, let's say that's your thing where you're like, I'm snacking late at night on high calorie. I'm just giving an example, mm -hmm. replace it with a non-food example, make that harder, you know, so do not yeah. keep that available, accessible in the house uh, at eye level. Yeah. Don't have it at all you know, or have bite-sized versions of it available. Yeah, I think my, my wife is good with that because she's been doing all the grocery shopping. She's done that, gosh, as long as we've been together. And and really the key for her is she just doesn't, and I tell her, like, just don't buy this stuff. Yeah. I, I don't, I, if I don't have it in the house, I'm not going to eat it. So I think that a lot of it, that's the key. You know, when you're looking at healthy behavior, just like you said, is is a low barrier of entry for those healthy practices, you know? And so for you, if you say, hey, I'm going to eat something unhealthy, Oh gosh, I got to get in my car. I got to go drive here. I got to go pick it up. Or I could eat something healthy that's already in the fridge. Yes. I'm just going to be lazy and eat the yes. healthy thing, which, hey, yeah. there you go. And you know, so, and you know what? Yeah, the, like the, the best way to cheat yourself into believing it is to say to yourself, the, the, the unhealthy bad thing, I'll go, I'll go get it, right? Like, I'm not going to keep this in my house. And if I want it, I'll just go get it. The reality yeah. is you're never going to go get it. And then you're going to be like, oh, shoot, I really wanted that. Ah, screw it, you know, and then you're not going to, you're not going to do it. And and you know what, if you do it every once in a while, like that's okay, oh, yeah. but it's, you know, but you have that, it's not easy and, and, and you splurge every once in a while yeah. and that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, so before we talk, um, before we kind of give, uh, ask people kind of where they can uh, get a hold of you and see you, I always ask, uh, end the interviews with a question of what one piece of advice would you like our listeners and our viewers to go away with? I want people to know that um, excellent mental health, exceptional wellness is within their hands and it is achievable. You only have to give it five minutes if you want in the beginning, but just know that like anything you're dreaming about, anything you're hoping for, it's all possible. I never thought it was possible. Now here I am talking to you and doing exciting, fun things. Um, and, and it's a practice. So stick with it. Don't give up. 
So her name is Dr. Sue Varma. Uh, she is a board certified psychiatrist. Her book is Practical Optimism, The Art, Science and Practice of Exceptional Well-Being. Um, actually, if you listen to this podcast or watch it, you will, uh, the book will be on sale wherever books are sold. It's on Amazon. I'm assuming it's, assuming it's at Barnes and Noble uh, and all bookstores. Uh, so definitely pick it up. Once again, it's Practical Optimism, The Art, Science and Practice of Exceptional Well-Being. It has a lot of very practical tools and suggestions of how you can become a practical optimist and look at life a bit differently and hopefully find that you live a longer, healthier, and happier life afterwards. So how do people find you, Sue? Uh, I know you're online on social media. Yeah, so the best way to connect with me is on social media. Um, Instagram is where I'm the most um, uh, readily available. And um, my handle is Dr. Sue Varma, the full word doctor spelled out, Sue Varma. And then my website, drsuvarma.com, same thing, the full word doctor spelled out. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This is a lot of fun and um, so much information in the book. We really just touched the surface of it. So t take a look at practical optimism and hopefully you can be a practical optimist. Uh, so thank you so much, thank everybody, you. for listening and for watching. My name is Dr. Anthony Yoon. I'm known as America's Holistic Plastic Surgeon, and this is the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. Remember, everybody, to eat real food, use clean skincare, and auto-juvenate before you operate.